Hello everybody, thank you for joining us at the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery for our Facebook Live session today. My name is Kate Morris and I work here at the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery and today we're going to meet Karen Ruki who is just here and Karen is the curator of the Pacific Cultures collection so really excited today to have a look at this very special collection mm -hmm. and all the things that it contains, well, not all of them because there's quite a lot so should we go inside and have a look? Great. Please come in. Thank you. Oh, it's quite cosy. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, look at look at all this. That's that's amazing. So many beautiful things. Yes, there are. And interesting things. Mm. Gosh. Well, welcome to the Pacific and all oh, the Indigenous collection stores. Um, my name's Karen and. Um, I'd just like to start with an acknowledgement and let you know that you are um, on the land of the Mui Nina people at Rosny. Well, we are. We're doing our feed from there. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community who are the continuing custodians of the land, sea and waterways of Luchawida, Tasmania. And welcome. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. So. Karen, can you tell us a little bit about your role here at the Tasmania Museum and Art, Art Gallery and what you do? Mm. Well, I look after the Pacific Collection here, which consists of about 6,000 objects, and I work within the First Peoples Art and Culture Department, and we've got probably um, a collection of about 11,000 objects altogether. So um, not only are they from the Pacific and from um, Aboriginal mainland and Tasmanian communities, but they're also from all around the world. Really? Yep. Gosh. So, so your role is to, to make sure the collection is looked after and you, you research the collection and, and what else do you do? At the moment we're wor working towards a big migration of the database onto a new system so that hopefully all the records of all the objects that are in TMAG will be accessible to the general public oh, okay. in the not too distant future. future. Now you, you don't come from Tasmania, do you, originally? You've come from New Zealand? That's right. And with that knowledge, it's been really important as the curator of this collection because you have insight um, into some very particular objects. Yep. Mm. I'm Ngāti Maniaputu, a tribe from the North Island of New Zealand. Mm. And um, I literally wove my way back into, the, into my culture after being brought up in Sydney on the mainland. And I suppose that's when I began to realise how important museum collections were because they were the things, uh, the collection items were the way I connected with my culture or reconnected. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So would you like to tell us about some of these amazing um, objects that you've got out for us? Yes. And, and their history and their significance? Yeah. Well, what um, uh, I've got on display, I'll put out for you today, uh, this first object is a mm. pew pew. It's a waist garment, a Maori waist garment. And um, I bought this out because uh, the way I reconnected or engaged with my community or culture was through weaving. I literally wove my way back into my community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so these garments that are in the collection are, are really important to us and really significant pieces of cultural attire. So these are worn in kapahaka performances, which is a, um, uh, like a, a way of doing Māori culture. Um, and they were woven from flax. Um, each strand is probably a strip of flax, which has been um, the skin of the flax. You can see where these dark areas are, has been scraped away with a muscle shell, just a simple muscle shell, probably bigger than that one. Um, and where the skin is removed, the fibres underneath are shown, and then these garments, once all the strips, uh, um, the skin is removed, the pattern design is made, they're woven together at the waist, up here, and then they're dipped into a mud, which is called paru, which has got a high iron content, and that's what gives the flax or that's what stains the mucca fibre black. So, and these are beautiful things. You can actually hear them when people are wearing them and performing in them. They make a beautiful percussive sound. So they're really gorgeous things, but they are actually, um, they've originated from a cloak, which is um, why, you know, we didn't really have waist garments 
way back in the day. So yeah, yeah that's where they've come from. So do you know much about the provenance of this? Oh, this one in particular, it doesn't have a great provenance, mm. um, but it does have this tag on the top here. If you have a look, at, if you can see that, I'm not sure. It says Nati Puniki. Oh, yes. And Nati Puniki was a, um, a Māori performance group that sort of originated from around the Wellington area. As more and more Māori were migrating to the city areas, it became important for some of those people to hold on to culture. So these pan-cultural groups um, formed. And Ngāti Puniki is, um, the name Puniki is um, a, a, an adaption of the name uh, Port Nicholson, which was the uh, one of the original names for uh, Wellington well, Harbour. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, and how did it arrive here in Hobart? I'm not sure. You That's one of the that. mysteries that ah, I need to, you, yeah, you do a little bit of investigating with. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah it's, a, it's a magnificent looking needs to be worn. <laughs> yeah, and, and you would never, I would never have realised that it was made out of flax. Yes, I know. Yeah. Flax was a really important, well, the most probably important uh, material that uh, not only was part of our garment making, but we also used it to bind our houses together. It also has medicinal properties and there's a whole um, knowledge that goes with the flax. Right, so, right. Yeah. yeah. Now I know that you've got, um, we don't have a huge amount of time and there's so much we could talk about, but you've, you have some other things ready for us to have yes, a look at. Yes, well so I was going to quickly yeah. show you um, this oh. little feathered kite, or a little feathered bag, kiwi feathered bag, which has also got a, a mukha foundation, the flax fibre again. And as this uh, uh, bag is constructed, the feathers are added in to the outside. And the feathers, um, the kiwis were really significant, but all feathers, um, I mean, all birds are significant for Māori because for us, even though the kiwi was a land-dwelling animal and those nocturnal elements are the things that we hold in high regard, birds were the closest thing to the gods for us. They hang in, hung in, out in the realm of the heavens. And so we kind of interpret birds as a way of uh, the messages from the gods. So a, a sort of spiritual connection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. that's why so many feathers are used. Well, we had a, a very strong relationship with our natural environment, environment <laughs> anyway. Yes, yeah, and yeah. which leads me on to ooh, our next ooh, little yes. um, object, which I'll just take out from the tray here. This is a, a papahoya, a, a papaho or a wakahoya. Sorry, I mixed the two names up then. And these boxes were actually considered like um, treasure boxes I suppose but they held things like feathers which we wore as hair ornamentation so the um, waka huya is named uh, from the huya bird so waka means vessel it's another name for a canoe as well but the huya is um, a very highly valued bird which no longer exists unfortunately um, but the these boxes were named up directly after them and they were hung from the rooftops um, to protect the contents and so as a result, I don't know if you can see that, but oh. the bottoms are often yes. carved because you're looking at it from below. And it's quite a different colour, presumably, because it's been sort of this one laid may, on its, yeah. It may have been stained the surface, oh, the wood. Right. So and the patterning on it. You can see they're all little um, faces, like oh, no, I ticky didn't, faces. I didn't see that. And a lot of times in carving, um, sometimes oh. when there's not two eyes, it means that sometimes they carve both the eyes to activate the carving. And sometimes they inlay shell in the eyes to activate a carving. But also carvings were activated, and that's through spiritual, mm. spiritually through the addition of feather and fibres because the movement of the feather and fibres kind of um, acknowledges the intangible presence of spirit in objects. There's so much to talk about just in one <laughs> yeah. object, isn't there? I know we've only just touched the surface, but um, yeah, it's extraordinary. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, just in terms of the natural environment, there's a couple of pieces down the bottom oh, here yes. uh, from the Solomon Islands. So this is um, 
a, a ceremonial bowl, but you'll see um, but Solomon Islands have a particular way of staining the wood. They usually, you can tell the dark bowls of the Solomons, they've been stained with a mix of plant juice and charcoal, but they have this beautiful intricate inlaid shell design on them as well. But the bird hit it, head up this end, the frigate bird, Oh yes. And the bonito fish were very important um, uh, things for uh, Solomon's culture and you'll see it again repeated on this uh, men's ornament here which it's this is a tema but you've got the tail of the frigate bird down this end the bonito fish up here and this has been carved out of soft softened tortoise shell the base disc shell is the giant clam and these were worn either on the forehead, the waist or around the neck. They're really um, important symbols of um, wealth as well as men's, as a status symbol for men as well. Mm. That's, it's quite big, isn't it? Yeah. Is yeah. it quite light? Well, it's quite, this is a little bit heavy, this one, but I think this one, yeah. They're a little bit weighty, but cool enough to wear. Oops, my mic's just fallen. Yeah. <laughs> but I've also got down here a couple of interesting bits because both this tema, this object here, and these reef sandals, I call them, or shoes, that have been woven out of um, natural fibres, um, are from the Solomons. And they were collected by a J.W. Beatty, who was a photographer. Yes. Uh, you know, around Hobart in yeah. the early 1900s, and he also had his own shop in Hobart that people would come to, his own little mini museum. <laughs> Where he would show things to people. Yeah. yeah. They're beautiful, aren't they? Yeah, they're yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. So protect your feet as you're going out on the reefs. So just going back to these, these other two um, things from the Solomon Islands. Yep. Where, how did they get here? Do we know? Well, uh, Beatty donated this Be one. This one. Yep. Okay. And this one doesn't have a clear provenance on him. So there's a lot of objects in the collection. Uh, I've only been here for six months, but oh, of course. there's lots yeah. of opportunity for research. So it would be great to have people come in and particularly mm. if we could have community people come in and share their knowledge it would be fantastic. Indeed. So there's still a lot to learn. Isn't yeah, there, there is. All yeah. these things. Yep. And what have you got up here? Um, I pulled a couple of objects from the uh, international collection oh. out. So this is a spoon. I'll just put it to the front. From the Tlingit culture in the northwest coast of America. It's made out of uh, mountain sheep horn and it's been moulded with hot water and um, probably a bit of steam. And the images on here are very reminiscent of totem pole. I don't mm. know if you can see it, but they're, yeah, they're cultural symbols and important animals. The killer whale probably with the teeth there, the wolf. But these spoons were very important because um, for Tlingit, the head, the mouth and the tongue were the most important parts of your body. So the practice of eating was very significant. It was more of a, it was a spiritual as well as a physical act. And in nourishing yourself, you're also nourishing the gods and honoring them. So, so interesting. <laughs> yeah. And that beautiful inlay. Yeah, it's it really what I would call pawa, I suppose. Pawa yeah. shell, but abalone. And the way, you know, as you move it, it, it the catches light catches the light. It. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a, an extraordinary spoon. Yeah, it's quite gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> well, look, can so I many. bounce around? I wanted to show yeah, you this yeah. as well. Oh, yes. Um, this heavy, it's quite heavy. <laughs> yeah, it looks heavy. <laughs> yeah, mm. but um, it's a patu muka or a flax stone beater. So once the flax, um, it's from New Zealand, Māori, once the flax, uh, the fibre, the muka is removed from the flax or the harakeki, it's beaten with this um, beater to soften it so it makes it really soft against the skin. So for cloaks and garments like that, mm. uh, this would be used. But this one's quite interesting because it was um, um, presented to the museum by a gentleman called Samuel Henry Drew 
and so he was an Englishman who spent some time in Tasmania but ended up uh, going with his family to New Zealand. His father was a jeweller. Um, they lived around the, he moved to the, they lived around Nelson, but he moved to the Whanganui area. And he was probably one of those early gentleman collectors. He amassed quite a collection of um, objects and his collection actually uh, was the basis for the Whanganui Museum. So it's really good that we've got one of uh, the mm. a piece connected to him, but also connected to the community as well. So do we have an idea of how old it might be? I'm not too sure no, how old no, it is or I'm what stone idea. this is made of, yeah. but the stone items in the collection, the adzes and the stone tools, are really significant things in culture because often they took a long time to make. So they might have been started with the grandfather but finished with the grandson. Right, so, so and three generations. To, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so, you know, we believe that the um, objects, they're, they're invested with the intention and imbued with the essence and energy of the people that made them as well as the people that used them, which is why we call our objects taonga, which is ancestral treasures, really translates as. Hmm. So, you know, they are like our people on the yes. shelf. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah or our ancestors anyway, so they're really significant and important and that would be one um, awesome thing if we could do more engagement with first people and mm. uh, I just want to let everybody know what's here in the collection. Yeah, well <laughs> so I'm finding it absolutely fascinating, I had no idea even working here that we had such a diverse collection. Yeah. yeah. Well, and this is just one room, isn't it? I yes. Mean, as you said, the 6,000 objects yeah. in this particular collection. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. lots to learn about. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully we'll get some on display in the near future. Right. I'm hoping. Yeah. Because um, yeah. they haven't really been on display since the Pacific Gallery was bumped out in 2013. And there were a lot of objects that went into the Mona Theatre of the World exhibition, which is where I first saw um, this amazing room of tupper cloth and then on uh, looking at the label realized that all the tupper was from tea mag mm -hmm. and then I'm like oh my gosh what else is here I've got to come and work here yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it's been a real treat yes. I've really enjoyed my time here because I'm not sure how long I'll be here for <laughs> well we've got, we've got a little bit more time and I can see this really oh, lovely yes. object here this is really interesting too so um, this is a little uh, basket mailed, made out of whale baleen. There's a little stone disc in the middle. It's got point barrow on it, Alaska. Whale baleen, so that's the sort of filtering system the in whales' yes, birds, obviously, for yeah. catching the krill. And I think it was quite a big process just to get the strands ready for weaving. They had to be split and cut and cleaned and kind of polished before they would be ready. And there's two different, you can see how evenly they've been split. There's two different widths. Yes. The main coil, the center coil, and then the, the, the coiling unit, which is quite skinny. They're beautiful little things. And this is quite a recent phenomenon. They sort of said that these baskets um, started being made around uh, 1914, like during the First World War, 1914 to 18. Really? Yeah, and there's, I'll try and get this gentleman's name right, mm. King, King Guttut, Tuck, King Guttut, who's rent, uh, supposedly the, you know, the, the gentleman who started this tradition off. So they used to make uh, a particular type of basket similar to this out of other material. Ooh. So, well, before you just put the lid on, yeah. you know, as we we can see, there's a bit of a treasure in there. Can, do you know what the that writing? Yeah, is? there's a little bit of a letter of um, a provenance and um, use of the basket that came in with it, which is really great. And this basket came in uh, with a collection from a gentleman called Robert Carl Stitch, so who um, was very significant in the. He was an engineer up at Mount Lyle. Ah. in Queenstown and he was another gentleman collector and um, he, mm. well, we got quite a bit of his collection. He passed away in the early 1900s but his collection didn't come to us about till about the 1960s. It had been through a few members of the family 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Always interesting connections, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it is. You know, you wouldn't imagine that could be connected to sort of Mount Lyle. No, but, I'd but love here to. it is. Yeah. yeah, it is so fine, isn't it? L looking at it, you know, it's gorgeous. Right here. Just as a weaver, I really love it. And then when I found out it was whale baleen, I was just amazed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's quite surprising, really. Yep. Yeah. And I've just got um, um, some yes. objects down here yes, that, that I thought I might oh, pull yes. out and show you. Sorry, get down. I could spend months <laughs> in here with you. So this is um, basically a, a, an outfit from uh, Papua New Guinea from the Oro province. And it's uh, a widow's outfit. And when um, the, the women from the Oro province, when their husbands passed away, they went into a state of mourning. And during that time, the uh, people around their village didn't see or hear from them, but their family members would come in and help them gather fibre, which um, mm. it's all spun string yes. here, and enough seeds, these are Job's Tears seeds, to make their mourning garments, which were... Um, um, sort of worn at the time to acknowledge that the grieving period was over so they would come out and be seen in these objects. They're really beautiful. They are and again such fine work. Yes. They're in beautiful condition. Yeah actually, so they? some yeah. of the objects are fantastic we're really lucky. And do we know how these arrived here? Um, those objects came through the Australian Board of Missions who were very active in the Pacific. <laughs> a right. lot of the collection um, material did come from missionaries and also from traders and uh, sea captains. Hobart was a really important port of call, a deep sea port that people would, there was mm -hmm. a lot of activity mm -hmm. around the area. So we've got some significant um, pieces from the early days when sea transport was the most important mode. Mm. Right. Gosh, <laughs> I feel really privileged to have come in and seen. I'll just pop these up you, here. Yes, seen just a tiny, tiny part of this collection. So thank you so much oh. for showing it to myself and Kath, who's filming yeah. over here. It's been absolutely fascinating to, to delve into these stores. Mm. But fortunately, it's Seniors Week next week. Mm. And I do believe we're, you're doing some tours and there's still a few spots left yep, if so people want to book. Yep, if yeah. they ring up Rosny. Um, I've sorry. got the number. No, <laughs> I, I, I have the number actually. Yeah, lucky that, wasn't it? Which is 6165 6929. So they're still, they're, they're, you're doing them every day next week, aren't yep, you? Yeah, every so day I'm, next week. Yeah, I'm not sure which day. I think Monday's have. booked out. Okay. It would be right. great to have people come in and have a little private tour of the collection. So if you're a senior in Tasmania, <laughs> um, then that might be a great opportunity to see some of the things that we've seen. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank and you for um, coming in and visiting us. Oh, it's been really, really interesting. So, um, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to our next Facebook Live, which will be in November. And it'll be a mystery, as usual. And um, thank you very much to the friends of TMAG for supporting this program. We really appreciate it. Mm. And um, thank you to Kath for filming. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.